Anyway, thank you very much to Lisbeth and John and to everybody who's helped, to Manaz, who helped organize this event and will be oh, one of our no, 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 no. You <laughs> oh, did, yes. Karen. I just helped a little bit. I didn't yeah, well, I'm, yes, you're going to be, you're going to be our first teacher. And okay. to everybody who's come and to all those that I can't say hello to who will be coming in later, uh, just delighted that you're all here. I'm going to do a couple of quotations from the girls that we honor as um, in the women's movement or in the girls' movement. And then um, I'm going to be looking forward to, to Carol opening this up with some great song. Now, all of you, yeah, remember to mute when I can see everybody's muted anyway while I'm talking. I'm sorry, Karen. <laughs> Karen, give me a moment uh, because Luz said she cannot see us. What's going on with Luz? She cannot see no, us. No, she can't. No, you have to, you have to. If, there are so many people, you have to move your arrow on the side. No, no, she, she said oh, she, she really can't, can't see us? No, she can't. Oh, I see you, but I don't know whether you are aware. Um, I see you, Luz, I okay, see yes. you. Luz, we can see you, yes, yes. We okay. can see you, Luz. We see. Okay, very good. Thank you. I can see you, Luz. I can see, Thank I think you. I can see everybody, but I have to air, put the arrow in because there are two screens worth of people. They didn't make it tiny, they just make it two screens. Okay, so... Um, yes, remember to mute when everybody else, other people are talking or poetizing and uh, enjoy this evening. And I will, I'm going to read quickly something from Malala Yousafzai, you know, who was shot in the head by the Taliban after she publicly advocated for girls' education. And then I'll read something from Greta Thunberg. I think they are both wonderful representatives of becoming women who will be making this world a better place. Malala said, one child, one teacher, one book and one pen can change the world. And Greta Turnberg said more, a little bit longer, she was talking specifically about International Women's Day. She says, there can be no social justice without gender equality. On International Women's Day, we highlight that women still aren't treated as equal to men. The fight has not been won. So save your celebrations. Doesn't this sound like Greta? Save your celebrations, save your congrats, and support women on the front lines of society worldwide. So those are my two little quotations from some of the youngsters that are coming up and have already made their mark on the world of women. And with this, I would like to introduce the wonderful, marvelous, fantastic Carol Denny, prize-winning lyricist, guitarist, concertina player, humorist, cartoonist, and uses the word fiddler. Uh, she plays with Failure to Disperse, Acoustic Revolt, and Roadshow, and Sons of the Buccaneers. Great titles. But her favorite place to be, she says, it's is making, making good trouble with a revolutionary poet's brigade. So Carol can do anything. Poet, lyricist, activist, great way to start our program. So you've got it, Carol, and I'm going to mute. Well, thank you, Karen and organizers for the honor. I'm going to play a song that Cinderella would sing if she had wised up a little bit. It's called Raised to be a Lady. to be a lady. I kept cooking so in did a classic Cinderella but the shoe just never fit. My sister took the pumpkin but I'm staying home this time. Maybe I'll go next year Bring me home some wine. Well, it's not hard to be a lady. You have coffee with the girls, collect some English china and a classic string of pearls, and you wear them to the ball, dear. But then the fancy is such a swine. Yeah, it 
It's not safe. To, let's see. It's not safe to take your shoes off or lose too much track of time. You are a classic string of pearls. And of course, on, on Zoom, we all can take our shoes off. <laughs> great, great. I love that. Some of us can be ladies and some of us, it's better just plain undefined. I love that. So thank you so much, Carol. And we will be privileged to have her ending up our occasion at the, when she'll be, I, I call her the bookend. She will be bookending at the end. And we're looking forward to that too. So now we move on to our other classic pearls, our classic poets. And um, Manaz Badihian, Iranian poet, translator of Farsi in the great Persian tradition. She has many, many publications to her credit. And most recently, Plague 2020, which included, of course, poetry that is involved with the pandemic with COVID and that came out last year. Uh, and that's, she's uh, just a delightful poet and translator. I love hearing her read Persian, read Farsi and she will be illuminating us to begin with. So please mute while Manaz Badihian takes the stand. Okay, hi everyone, happy March 8th. And good to have all of you. Thanks to Lisbeth and Karen for helping with this event. Also, Karen, the book that I published is Poetry and Art Related to COVID-19 from Around the World. And it's available on Amazon. Anyways, okay. I, I will read a poem that I wrote 2008 when I was coming back from Lahore 
uh, visiting some friends, coming back to San Francisco. I wrote the poem in 2008, and I translated the poem today for this event. I will read part of it in Farsi, and then I will read the translation that I did today. دخترم کنار جوی مولیان زیر ماه نخشب زیبا شده بود در پیچ و تاب مویش چیزی بود از پیچ و تاب تاریخ شگفتر و ما با ساگه ای افثانه ای گریخت از زیر گیسوان درخت انگور بر گوشه لبانش بیتوته کرده بود به دخترم گفتم ای قد برافراشته ای ذهن هوشیار تا آستانه نجات من هستی The poem called You are on the verge of saving me Can you guys hear me all right? Can everyone hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. You're wonderful. Oh, okay. You are on the verge of saving me. My daughter was next to the mirror of Dorian Gray. Under the moon, she was beautiful. There was something in the locks of her hair more surprising than the turns in history. And the moon with a mythical shadow escaped from the vineyard hiding in the corner of her lips. I told my daughter you're aware with a conscious mind. You're on the verge of saving me and save the one who thinks we will seize life from malice one day and divide the remi remainder of our pride. One day we will fly our milk-filled breasts under the sun for the thirsty birds so they can build their nest on the top of our breast. My daughter knows she's beautiful in her mind, beautiful in her mighty hands, and she knows very well that the roses every day, every year, dry in gardens. Only the roots can stay. I said to my daughter, you're beautiful, so beautiful, that with the daughters of unknown lands, with prairie girls and with the street girls, you will divide the sun on your shoulders and teach us equality. Thank you. Thank you, Ekeran. That is beautiful, Manaz. Did you. you have anything else you wanted to say? That was wonderful. Thank you. I uh, just much. see the birds making their nests in, in the breasts flying under the sun. It's just a lovely image. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you, you so much, Manai. Thank you. And thank you for reminding us that that book that you wrote, Plague 2020, is art as well as poetry. Thank you. So our next poet is, um, we were talking to a very briefly at the beginning because she is opening a, again on May 1st the Clarion Performing Arts Center, which she's the director and owner of. And that's in San Francisco, Chinatown. Um, it's right off the 30. If you take that stop, you can walk up. It's only a couple blocks. She brings poetry to senior centers as well as burlesque and cabaret shows. And she's written a couple of plays that she's done at Clarion. I know one of them is the piano. And I saw the other one. I can't remember the name of it. but. I just feel very honored that Clara's view has taken the time to come to our event, and I look forward to hearing her read. So Clara, go for it, and I will mute. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, everybody. 
Karen, I have prepared three pieces. Is that okay? Okay. Um, the first poem is the translation uh, of a woman poet, uh, Chinese woman poet um, in the Song Dynasty. So that's um, about um, 1100 uh, BC. And, um, oh, 1180, I'm sorry. And the, uh, and the piece is called A Cut of Plum Branch. And uh, I'm gonna read it in Cantonese first, and then I'm gonna read it, my translation in English. Yatsin Mui. Hong Ngau Hang Chan Yuk Lim Chau. Hing Gai Lo Sang, Duk Sang Lan Zhou. Wan Zhong Sui Gai Gam Su Lai, Nan Zi Hui Si. Autumn's red lotus burnt incense and jade mat. Untie the translucent gown, step onto the orchid boat. Who would send a message on silk high above the cloud? When the geese return as an ideogram, a full moon fills the west pavilion. Flowers drift and water flow on their own accord. One kind of reverie two parts of leisurely sadness. Nothing can dispel the feeling. The moment it drops from the brow, it swells in the heart. I felt to mention the poet's name is Lei Qingjiu, Li Qingjiao. The second poem that I'd like to share with you is, um, a poem that I combined two uh, Chinese poets, uh, Chinese women poets. One was in the um, was born in 1900. Her name is Bing Xing, and the next one, the second one, um, her name is Ju Sukzan, and she was born um, 1135. So they were many, many years apart, but I thought it would be interesting to put them together in poetry. And uh, you could see the, the uh, Bing Xing who is uh, more modern, she is uh, much more secure in herself as a writer. Whereas Ju Suk Zhan who was born uh, in 1135, um, was quite repressed and had much less power um, as a poet. Um, in fact, when she died, her parents burned most of her poems, so only very few was left. So in this poem, it's called Dialogue. Um, it, I would start with Bing Sing and then switch to Ju Suk Zhan. Volatile mood. Should it be received, can gush out extraordinary thoughts, give rise to magical writing. New Year's Eve, the year before, lights were bright as day in the flower market. At the top of the willow, the moon, a trust in the late evening. You drop would rather be the night companion of the shivering flower, but won't let the bright morning sun gives her a hint of warmth. On this New Year's Eve, 
moon and light are the same. Last year's person cannot be seen. Vernal's leaves are wet with tears. How to forget summer night beneath the bright moon, leaning against the balusters, smothering red lotus, dark green canopy of leaves, white silk dress. And the third one um, is titled The Old Poets of Chinatown. So this is about, um, this is about um, the poets that I discovered and befriended with in San Francisco Chinatown. So a lot of the poem, when it gets into the poetry, um, I use a lot of uh, their poems, um, but I had to translate them because they were all written in Chinese. Poetry, uh, the old poets in Chinatown. Five, five, the fifth of May, pedal the dragon boats, eat Zhongzi by the bay. The poet had sunk to the bottom of the river. Nothing is sadder, ah, than separation. In the town of funky old lanterns and alleys littered with cigarette butts, Li Po is but a cocktail lounge. Heightened thoughts dissipate in the porridge steam. Duck grease drips down window panes, the moans of China's progeny, their tired backs, their bloodshot eyes, weariness squeezes the minds dry. Children open their mouths and cannot sing. Grown-ups hiss and spit in their streets. The heart is heavy, ah, unsettling. A man treaded gently up the hill. Illness had made him gentle. He found the mail slot at the corner of my building and was about to shove a book through. I opened the door. Hello. Breathless, his eyes looked even wider behind the huge glasses. A bit of rouge. We had met the day before into a smear of blood and tear. I gave him my book, swaying in loneliness, a window into a stranger's mind that derives from a thousand years of sorrow. Don't ask the blossoms and the leaves about emotion. Let's just carry the hangover and stagger into a carmine reverie. He told me he had a few essays to write and left. He sent me the finished work by email. But the poet has blurred into the streets of trinkets and meat markets. Sometimes brutal sometimes gentle. How bright the moon. We are being cut down by age. Ask the clear sky with wine and becoming the old poets of Chinatown, not knowing in the heavenly palace what year is this night. Live laugh, cry, die among the sound of mahjong. I would ride the wind and depart, mouths and bodies yearning to be touched, but I fear the bejeweled jade dwellings, the cold in high places. At Chinatown's one day sidewalk sale, I put the table out on Waverly Place with my books and broadsides. Jenny Lim dropped by the day before and gave me her chapbooks. Frances Chin arrived with her memoirs in a suitcase. It was a warm and sunny day. We hung out in front of Clarion. Frances met a fan of hers and struck up a lively conversation. Nellie Wong came a little later with her books too. Earlier in the day, the youth community across the street brought over some helium balloons. I tied them on the handle of a poster board. 
fidget spinners was selling by the bushel down on Grant Avenue. At least that's what I heard. Pedestrian hastened the speed when passing our table. A few brave ones turned their heads toward the boats for just a second but inevitably look the other way to catch an eye or a smile to catch the attention of someone not interested. Poetry is sunning in broad daylight. Not interested. Vibrant and thoughtful women are ready to converse. Not interested. Are we as obscure as creatures from Mars? Those creatures might be more interesting than poets. Oh, you can't ignore us. We are here to stay in the town that sells everything. The five colors blind the eyes in the town where all languages are spoken. The five tones deafen the ears in the town that relishes food. The five flavors coy the palate. In the town where conversations wind around the wooden stools of Sam Wall, where Sing Chu Wang and his wife Gimme record reading love poems to each other on their wedding day, 20 roses blooming, spring eternal. At midnight, I scribble to the bells of the old St. Mary's, drink paper wine, becoming intoxicated. Thank you. <laughs> that is so beautiful, Claire. Thank you so much. So expressive. As you say, the gentle and the beautiful. And I feel as if I heard all of this sitting in an orchid boat. <laughs> just, just lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. So expressive. And the way you read is equal to your poetry. Thank you. Uh, Devorah we have now. Devorah Major is an art activist. She's famous, really. I have so little that she gave me to read about, but she's a much published poet, novelist, professor, mother, grandmother, friend, and lover of the earth and all its people. So I, th I feel very honored to uh, introduce to you now, Deborah Major. So please mute and listen. Okay, so I guess I should unmute. <laughs> okay, great to be here with everybody. Just wonderful to see like Claire, I haven't seen for ages. You look great and Jean look great and Dottie, it just, all of you, wonderful. Anyway, I have three poems, uh, all fairly short. Uh, the first one by Ayo Ayola Amali, who is from Southwest Nigeria. Wearied gamblers. Wuhan in the beginning when all is stolen out in a ragged bat. I sit in silence of the moon under a neem tree and look my deep wounding through as I follow the dusk out to the deep to yet another day. I write in these Kovic verses. I write in compelling stillness. I write and let the crammed words lurching along the tracks fill my thoughts to the world. I write this letter where flogging waves push me from the breath borrow and clog my heart swollen with sorrow. I'm ripping these muddled thoughts like the scalded umber bursting in the wings of a moth too long winded. You and I are wearied gamblers in an immense innumerable world. This letter slips from a gnawing noise of sneezing, a ravaging pandemic sweeps the world, grips lives and covered breath like a sealed envelope and everything collapses. You and I are wearied gamblers sending forth interminable missives in mask nose and mouth with sterile hands washed like a pro. Yesterday, the moonlight came and swallowed the chaos like a python and left long ago, casting its shadows over our face in black and white, sheltered in place, sniffing out like nothing ever happened. 
you and I are wearied gamblers in this together but apart. And now I can see without light. I can see more loudly what is inside. There is room for all in the fragrance of the heart's soul. In brilliance, we'd make a new world. And again, that's Ayo Ayola Amali. Uh, who's known as being a poet for a positive social change in Nigeria. And that's from an anthology called Musings in the Time of Pandemics out of Kenya. And this is another one. Uh, but this one is by a uh, poet, uh, Radha Chakravarti from Delhi. Another Exodus 2020. No seas part for their crossing, no promised land awaits them on that other shore. Displaced their years of toil disowned by our callous city, migrant masses leave this place of unbelonging. No grieving friends, no fond farewells as they commence the longest journey. Fear in a knapsack on the back, dream of a home, a bundle on the head. They trudge their weary way together on a journey to nowhere. No signpost here. The sky their guide and thirst for home their friend. No mask conceals their hunger. They do not wash their hands calloused from days of work. On the road to nowhere, there is no water. The highway to oblivion is not sanitized. Sadness seeps like blood from soles of broken feet, leaving telltale narratives on the sail on the soil, but their flagging footsteps track their still unbroken faith in finding home as they march on the highway of their dreams, their longest journey. And again, that's Bairada Chakravarti from Delhi, who's a writer and critic and translator. And one short one of mine, Woman of Peace. In the me that is me, peace. Take away the she who is named duty, relationship, status, accomplishment. Take away the she who wears any cloak, however thin. Strip me down to the me that is me, unchanging, bare, peace. Never wanted to fight as a child, never wanted to hit or be hit. Understood early on the lessons to be learned from violence were of little value. Fear and resentment, cruelty, domination, revenge, always a wound, always a scar, always damage, peace, the me that is me. Wherever, whatever else I am or am not, whatever else I have or simply desire, whatever else I dream of or fear, peace. I struggle for justice, peace. I resist oppression, peace. I hold on to humanity, peace. Peace in my footstrips, peace in my tongue peace in my heart. Thank you. Thank you so much, Devorah. I mean, from the first poets, I still have words like words lurch and flogging waves. But um, I love the, the poetry from New Delhi, I believe, and, and your own poetry. It's just a treasure. To, to hear you to hear you read. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you. And now we have Jamie, who just got back from the cat hospital, taking her cat in. And she's a wonderful, wonderful Chinese poet, translator, mother, and cat mother. Uh, this is Jamie Proctor Tzu. She writes in Chinese and English. She is a recipient of a Tzu Jiang, Poetry Award and her translations of the Chinese poet Song Lin won the Northern California Book Award for Poetry and Translation. So I'm honored to present to you, everybody mute along with me, uh, the wonderful Jamie Proctor Tsu. Hello, thank you so much um, for inviting me to be here among so many beloved friends that I haven't seen in so long. Um, and also some unfamiliar faces, but um, it's just such an honor to read with all of you. Um, and um, I'll just to clarify, I'm actually a poet from the US, but I write in Chinese and English and I um, do a lot of work with China. Um, 
uh, organizing poetry events and um, writing in Chinese also. So um, I'm gonna read two poems by a Chinese contemporary woman poet first and then one of mine to conclude. Um, the poet that I'm reading is Xiao Xiao, um, spelled X-I-A-O, X-I-A-O, um, who's a woman poet um, from Sichuan. Uh, she currently lives in Beijing and her poetry has won awards in China and around the world. And um, I'm currently translating a collection of her poems. So I just thought I'd share a couple of them. Um, I'll read the first one in English and Chinese. Um, Sky Burial Platform, An Empty Skull, the migration of a gust of wind, a cluster of bone dust flying, hand holding hand blown into this dawn. The flesh walking toward the horizon causes the sun to stick out its tongue and rise swiftly. Their last song in this world is the sparks that spray out when the hammer leaps into the body. Her speed is the instant the clothes are unfastened, is someone on a rainy night whose hopes turn to ash in the morning. Show. 牵着手是某个雨夜之人 And I also chose that partly to um, think about all the people right now around the world and here who've um, passed on this past year and um, for all of those who are suffering and have loved ones who are suffering. So I um, just want to remember everybody and send out love. Um, so the next poem uh, is also a poem by Xiao Xiao. I'll just read it in English um, for a time. Say to the soul, you need to make yourself happy a million times faster. Remove the shackles of long held delusions from your neck, throw them away. When you open your eyes from the window of long held suffering, take a deep breath and rub your veins in the subtlest, most real waves deep in the soul. How much clamor comes from your imaginary enemies? How many obstructions come from your blood relatives? How much necrosis comes from your dark parts? You can't make everything become possible. You only have one body, one heart, scattered in the headwind. Write happiness on the back cover of suffering. Don't let the heavy burdens in your life be fatal. Live purely for yourself once, at least for 60 seconds, at most for the rest of your life. Okay, and then I'll conclude with a poem that I wrote. Um, and I'm reading this in solidarity with everybody who's a survivor of um, sexual violence. Huang Shan. As the trees grew horizontally from granite peaks, I held my son's hand. We climbed stone steps in mist, trying not to slip. Could be the beginning of anyone's poem. The ancients heard voices in the mist and knew they weren't alone. And I grasped my five-year-old son's hand, noticed where tiny saplings had taken root in the cracks. 
Looking out into the sky where the peaks end, I tried to push back the flashbacks coming through my collarbone into the throat where consciousness forms clouds, wetting words until they dissolve prior to articulation. Two nights before, a man had held me against a wall in the darkness of a marble stairwell. I'd threatened to scream if he didn't let me go, but I couldn't find my voice loudly enough or I let the shame of worrying what others would say if I screamed silence me. I heard my PhD advisor's voice saying I shouldn't have gotten myself into that situation, though she was at an institution all the way across the ocean. I pictured trying to explain to whomever came out how I ended up there, though going back with my pin, I realized it was a distorted thinking of fear, nothing more or less. None of these questions ever matter in the aftermath, how he'd grabbed hold of my purse, then grabbed hold of me, and I thought I could get away, but I couldn't, and I never found the voice to scream, so I tried to push him away and just waited for it to end. A large sorrel bird was gathering sticks for a nest, I suppose, so I sat and watched him running from bush to place to place in the mist, noticing the sticks he carried, thinking of the sorrel horse my sister had that threw my dad breaking one of his ribs. Look at that bird, I told my son, wanting him to see and know that life is built over and over. Later that night, as his father lay on top of me, I let myself be held in that familiar rocking, the fog rolling out from me, a tree, a tree, so many needles falling. I tilted my head back when the tears came, not wanting him to feel them or hear them, and he didn't, but I ached that he didn't notice anyway. When stone splits, it never rejoins, even when the mountainsides move this way, resettle, and new trees grow in the tiny fissures or valleys that form. Even in the lines of ancients, we begin to feel ourselves replanted and undone. Thank you. Oh, Jamie, oh, that is so beautiful and so sad. And I think of the, the, the poem where you said to write happiness on the backside of suffering. Um, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us, Jamie. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> and now we go on to another great poet, Jean Powell, a published poet and essayist with four books in print. She is the founder of Meridian Press Work and her movie reviews appear online. She's taught and performed extensively, and here we're lucky to have her with us. So I'm going to mute and listen to Jean. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, everyone who has attended, who is attending. I'm going to read five short poems. A writing prayer. I write the way I pray, sporadically and with the mind of a skeptic. I know she is there, in there, out here in the golden flowers drooping between tree branches, in shadows dancing on air currents. Her eye is on the sparrow, and I fear she sees me too well, this muse, forgiving mother of us all, and yet taskmaster stirring the pot, admonishing us to measure up, toughen up to our greatness inherent at birth. For we poets are the chosen ones, and everything depends on that sunbeam gracing the flight pattern of a honeybee and the cloud cover aiding the journey of a snow leopard. For we poets are the chosen ones, as surely as a red-tailed hawk dives from a mountain to a forest of feasting. This one is called, Did You Know? The Fruitvale Bart Station, Oakland, California, January 1st, 2009. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, 
of thee I sing. Did you know before today a bullet fired in disdain, callous indifference into a young father's back as he lies face down on harsh cement will power through, race through his body prone, bounce off the pavement cold and splash back into vital organs like the heart and spirit and soul, leaving no room for compromise, explanation or forgiveness and no time to say goodbye to his lovely baby daughter. But you know now. Of thee I sing for Oscar Grant. This one is swing dance. It's for my mother. When you left me to go hide in that silk lined casket, I pulled fresh dandelions and hid them in my coat until the grave diggers rested their shovels. I scattered your lioness dandies on the dirt covering your new home. Near the end of my childish days, you always did travel without me. This cemetery trick was no new game. To see you dance once more to that swing music you liked on the radio when you thought no one was watching, recalling a time before husband and kids and worries when you worked swing shift with all the other rosies, then danced the night away. To hear you laugh once more would have been sweet. This one's called Journey. The moment my souls touched the tarmac, I did not think of you at all. The old gang enveloped me in sweet tasting tavern songs and marching chants, evoking times when walls tumbled and dreams lived hard, but high up where all could see and gain the heart they had to have. In honor of my visit, we would mourn Plum Street, conjure Canada outlaws, celebrate Greek town excursions, recall car treks to nine mile drive along rock salted lanes to view Christmas miracles in the snow. I did not think of you at all. At times, a traffic signal took too long to change and I would see your face in profile on an iced over sign warning of washed out roads or detours just ahead. Then friends would turn our car into an evergreen drive where warmer faces waited to rekindle select days, as is proper on a journey of the heart. Once under the weeping willow in Louise's backyard, I thought I saw a wedge from a croquet mallet, faded paint blending into winter grass barely exposed. But from the porch came shouts, reassuring in their heartiness that hot mulled wine was waiting. And so there was no time to think of you at all. My final poem, remember Kathy Freeman, the Aboriginal athlete who won gold medals for Australia. She was chosen to light the torch for the new Olympic games. And for a moment, for a moment, I was very frightened. Wading into reflections, immersed in the roar of the crowd, free Kathy walked toward the center of the earth, lowered her torch to the still waters, ignited a running ring, a fire dance surrounded her. Please do not let them burn her. Logic said they left her a way to escape. They won't burn her. She's their only Aboriginal symbol, pioneer and champion. Reason replied, they burn symbols have incinerated pioneers may sacrifice champions. Do not let them burn her. She would make such a glowing sacrifice, consecrate the games, fire their spirits, purify the hemorrhaging history of down orders, new world order. So brave, her grace in silent running waves all around her. Do not let them burn her. A sly miracle woman, she escaped the burning, stepped clear of the ring, leaving the fire this time, and faced the arena where the crowds waited for the games to begin. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jean, and thank you for reminding us of that, the Aboriginal athlete that filled on my heart, certainly. I have the same worries that you did. And thank you so much for your poetry of mourning and heart and the dandelions. Um, it's just very, very beautiful. I feel privileged to hear you read. Thank you, Jane. Um, and we have the lovely, wonderful Nina Serrano, an active 86-year-old poet who lives in Vallejo, California, and produces La Raza Chronicles and cover to cover radio programs for KPFA in Berkeley and literary dialogues with Nina Serrano for OzCat Radio in Vallejo. She's a very, very busy, very honored um, poet that we all love. Nina is one of those persons that will always reach out and will always have the right words to say. She is a woman of heart. So please, Nina, delighted to have you here. And I'm muting. Thank you, Karen. I have loved and been very moved by all the poems I've heard so far. I don't know how to work that chat thing very well, so I haven't been able to tell you, but all of your poems were deeply moving. And it's wonderful to hear all of these languages on this International Women's Day. And I'm going to begin with International Women's Day prayer for women whose children were stolen at the border. May we rise in health and happiness globally and take our place in the sun, reclaiming the rights of Mother Earth strongly, gracefully, bravely, lovingly, holding up half the sky. This next poem, I have to keep one hand on the space bar so you can hear me while I turn the pages, sorry. An old tradition. My six year old great granddaughter Lily is becoming a writer. She is writing and illustrating a book entitled The Adventures of Lilix, L-I-L-X-Y. She spells out her pen name. The final Y is silent. At the same time, she is learning how to form the alphabet letters for the book's words. There's a lot of literary and literacy involved in writing a book. I'm going to keep it forever, she says. I, the veteran writer, write a poem about it. Nina, you're muted. You accidentally muted yourself. Yeah. Oops. Nina, you are still muted, sweetie. Nina, 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 Nina. Unmute. Unmute. Ah. Help. You are unmuted now. Good, 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 good. You hear me? Hear me? Yes, we hear you yes, now. Yes, we can Thank hear you. you now. Oh, good. Thank you. International Women's Day, March 8th, 1975, Havana, Cuba. Chi cha cha cha, chi cha cha cha. The men from our office assault us. It's an attack. They come beating on tin cans. Chi cha cha cha, chi cha cha cha. One carries a guitar, two share a hand-painted sign, down with machismo, they chant, down with machismo. The guitar plays Guantanamera. We are being serenaded as we lean over banisters, leaving typewriters, dictionaries, and telephones abandoned. They speak in praise of women, of women as comrades. They present us with a bouquet of flowers. We cheer, they chant, down with machismo. We agree, they beat out a rhythm to send it to its grave. They are gone, chi, cha-cha-cha, trails behind. 
We hear them attack our sisters in the other buildings. Our typewriters click again. Our thoughts click. We are working. We are smiling. This next poem is called Childbirth and the Nature of Pain. The night I gave birth the second time, I caught my thigh. I cut my thigh while writhing against the bedsheet and got scratched by a sliver of something, an outrage, as if there was not enough pain already. Pain, blessedly, cannot be recalled, only that it hurt but not the sensation itself, not the way the memory of a kiss, an embrace with all the sensuous details of taste, touch, smell, the sighs, the grunts and growls of pleasure. At the birth sounds after the injection, I remember hearing animal sounds and thinking how strange that the attending hospital nuns were so wild and later realizing the wildness was me. Red flower of the last blood. I miss that juicy, wet, bloody mess that made me stop and deal with my body, even through the days of bloating, cramping blood and desire hanging on to the galloping mare of emotions by the tail, the neck, or the bridle. Even when jumping fences, forging rivers, and flying over the moon, that wet, juicy, bloody mess that created a bloody mess on panties, nighties, and sheets, even left stains on the white dress and chair, that white, juicy, bloody mess that sent me for rags, factory-made pads, and even irritating tampons that could bring disease. Causing worries till it appeared again. Swallowing pills to insert jelly covered diaphragms and even the deadly Dalkin shield that made for a hospital stay. That wet, juicy, bloody mess whose absence led down the frightened path of illegal abortion littered with pain and guilt, that wet, juicy, bloody mess tied me to the lunar calendar. Now I submit only to the sun and stars, the hot flashes they ignite of smoldering aspirations, volcanic revolutions, and mellow rebirths. I am so visible. I have never been as visible as at this moment. There were times when I have said, I am invisible. Then you would say, but I can see you. I saw myself reflected in a puddle of tears. So even I knew I was really there. That was ages ago when I was going through menopause and men in the street no longer noticed me, no longer harassed me. So I thought I was invisible. But now in this post-menopausal zest, at this moment, I am so visible, no matter who doesn't see me. Thank you. Mira, there's an old woman in a glittery t-shirt smiling at me in the mirror. What's she so pleased about? just that she's still standing and feeling very excited to be alive at the same time as you. Who knows how long it'll last, it doesn't matter. I'm going to sleep now. I look forward to waking up and making my bed and seeing her in the mirror again. This poem was written on my 85th birthday. The story of two Ninas. Two Ninas a generation apart, the younger said to the older, I read in your biography that as a child, you traveled in New York City on subways and buses alone. The older in response told the younger how between the ages of 10 and 12, she had seen many penises because sometimes men on trains exposed themselves penis after penis. 
the younger said, me too. I traveled on subways and buses at those ages and taking advantage of crowded conditions, men would rub against me. Ne neither of the Ninas had ever discussed this aloud. They had simply found clever, youthful ways to escape their pursuers, assuming it was part of the price of the freedom to travel. It took thousands of Me Too's decades later to mention it because sexual harassment had been so commonplace, so unspeakably unnotable that even decades later, when two accused molesters sit on the Supreme Court to pass judgment, determining what civil society allows, the two Ninas broke their silence. Their misadventures spilled out, trapped for decades, as the shared Me Too stories movement begins an unstoppable avalanche to smash the patriarchy. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nina. Wow. From down with machismo to all the extraordinarily sensitive uh, discussion of female issues that are so seldom mentioned. And I love the two poems at the end, the mirror and the two Ninas talking to each other. This was just beautiful poetry. So thank you so much, Nina, for, for coming in and speaking to us. Um, just so different and I love your message. Thank you. So now we have a special guest from Puerto Rico, um, who most of you probably don't know, but I, I see that some of you do. This is Luz Maria Lopez. She's a bilingual author, translator, president of the Committee for the International Book Fair in Mayaguez, Puerto Rico, and helps organize countless other literary events. She received the Sean A. Adab Award um, for the 11th International Writers Festival, University of Udaipur, India, 2016. Her poetry is translated into more than 20 languages. So it gives me a great deal of honor. Oh, and she loves dancing salsa. So <laughs> I'm going to mute while I bring you Luz Maria Lopez. Um, good night to everyone. Here is midnight. I am really enjoying this adventure with you here. I am so impressed with these beautiful, passionate ladies' poets reading poetry here. And curiously, um, I have met Ayo Ayola in Accra, Ghana, and Deborah was reading her poetry a while ago. Uh, I was commenting to Mana, and yes, I I also done Sha Sha Sha, so I also relate to that point that was just read. And I have selected two points more related to the core of women's feeling because we are celebrating the Women's uh, International Day. And I'm going to read first in Spanish and then my own translation to English is just two points. So the first point is titled Yo, which means me. I'm going to read it in Spanish. Soy una mujer buscando la auténtica denotación de vida. Mil vórtices de atrevido vigor donde todos mis cortos pasos puedan convertirse en un rizoma esparciendo potenciales en sueños espirituales y carnales, no estos aromas de vida virtual tan inútil, porque me voy perdiendo en soledad, no decepcionar nunca mis ojos y estas manos plenas de calor, nunca perder el control del tiempo, la llamada del amor ofreciendo una palpitante emoción, Nunca perder la única puerta hacia la sagrada rapsodia. Translation to English. Me. 
I am a woman seeking the truest detonation of life, thousand vortices of daring vigor, where all my tiny steps can be turned into a rhizome spreading potentials for spiritual and flesh reveries. Not these aromas of virtual life so futile, but I am getting lost in solitude, never to deceive my eyes and these hands full of warmth, never to lose the grip on time, the love call offering a pulsing emotion, never to miss the only door to secret rhapsody. I, I am wondering if I am being heard. Yes, we hear you. You're wonderful. Yes. It, okay. I was wondering because I didn't see me on the screen. So I was wondering whether I have the sound or, or the. We see sound. you. <laughs> we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. The other point that I have uh, chosen is uh, fragmentada, fractalized. Uh, we read in Spanish very, very quickly, and then the version in English. Estos insomnes días vagando en el badén, aromatizando visiones pasajeras, esencias estenuadas por el soplo del viento, el rubor desaliñado de las rosas rojas del jardín, los deseos oxidándose sobre los ojos y las voces deshilachadas pulsando minutos en mis manos, torbellino de imágenes circulando veloces, dispersión en contra del reloj de los libros de la mente. Y detrás de las paredes aún escucho el eco de viejas canciones de bellonera llenando la copa de vino con poesía fragmentada. Veo tus sombras escurrirse por el dintel de la puerta, atadas siempre a mis carnes nidias y al mar que todo se lo lleva irremisiblemente. Pero aquí, donde los días aún sueñan, no hay olvido o renuncia alguna, solo cúmulos de sal para sanar Tanta herida. I will read the English version now, and this is my last reading. Fractalized. These awakened days, aromatized with visions, wash out scents. These have a colors, forgotten desire, frayed voices, pulsing the minutes going. On my hands, the whirlwind of images going too fast, counter clock dispersion from the mind's books. And behind the curtains, I yet hear the echo of old songs, filling the cup of wine with poetry, getting myself fractalized. I see your shadow sleeping under the lintel of the door behind my eyes and the sea that takes everything away, irremediable trance, but here where the days close, there isn't forgetfulness or any resignation, just heaps of salt to heal the wounds. Thank you very much. Beautiful love, you, and I'm so happy to hear Spanish and English translation. And I love yeah. the, 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 towards the end of your last poem, fill, filling the cup of wine with poetry. Just sort of put a beautiful idea. <laughs> Thank you so much. Karen, you're muted. Yes, yes, I made that mistake of, of unmuting with the bar and then forgetting. 
I let go of the bar and okay, so here I am. Um, Nahid Arya is um, a poet from Afghanistan who has spent her life really working for women's rights um, in Afghanistan. And she's an activist. She often uh, has used the, the symbol of the burqa, which she may even be wearing tonight. She beautiful burqas to illustrate the fact that women do not have rights yet. And this is kind of an icon of her activism. So I would love to introduce to you now, Nahid Arya, Afghan poet and activist. Uh, happy International Women's Day for all my friends and poets who participated in this program. And thank you, Karen for giving me this opportunity to bring the voice of the Afghan women for the world. I'm not a poet, but I'm reading poem because it is an expression of the feeling. Right now, I have a book, poetry book. It was written in Afghanistan by women. The, there was a project that those women bring their voice in English poets and we translated in Farsi. I have all the poems about what is women's thinking over there because of the Taliban is taking over the Afghanistan again and it is a oppression about the women's and violence against women and nobody's listening to them and there is a no voice for them. By this book, it was a project was founded in 2009 by American journalist. Her name is Marsha Hamilton. In defense of the human rights to voice one story, a right that has too often been denied Afghan women. They believe that telling one story builds confidence, creates possibility for economic independence, and instills leadership abilities while advancing freedom of speech. Through online writing workshop, facilitated by international writers, educators, and journalists, empowers women writers in seven of Afghanistan 34 provinces by supporting them in development of their voices. Poems and essays are published in an online magazine that carries the writer's voice to an international audience and provides unparalleled insight into what it means to be a woman in Afghanistan. Each piece in this bilingual anthropology was first written in English workshop. The collection then translated as a whole into Dari, also called Afghan Persian. This be the first time for many writers that their words will be printed in their own language, a reality for women living in Afghanistan. The impact of their bravery is but the beginning of the quiet revolution powered by the pen of Afghan Women Project, who are nourished by the truth of their own words. Brilliantly pressing for basic human rights, their voices built one upon another until it became impossible to stifle the strength and the resilience spirit of the Afghan women. I'm going to read one of the poems is about, you know, they call it brothers because they call the Taliban as a brother. It is written in English and also in Farsi. First, I'm going to read the Farsi or English, which one you prefer. So probably I will read it for English. They call it brothers. When he cut the root of my grape garden, he said, die of hunger. When he cut the root of my grape gardens, he said, die of hunger. When he closed the door of my school, he said, die of ignorance. When he broke our 5,000 year old Buddhas, he said, die without history. 
when he locked me in my home, in my chadar, chadar means is a scarf that they covering their face. It is like, I'm showing you like now, it is, I have this chadar, but they want, you know, cover their face. You know, burqa, you see the burqa over here? They cover women by burqa, that they lose their identity. When he said that, that he, when he locked me in my home in my chadar, he screamed, die with no identity, even before you did. He made me dream of the beauty of death, of the peace and death, of the comfort in death. Then I you know, come. He promised to save me, my identity and my dignity. Now that years have passed, I see that the hero lied. Since he calls the devil of death, brother. Maybe he didn't include me in that, I'm not. So now I'm going to read the Farsi, Brother Ross. وقت ریشه های باغ انگورم را از بن برید گفت از گرسنگی بمید. وقت درب مکتب مرا بست گفت از جهر بمید. وقت بوده های پجزار سالی مرا شکست گفت از فقر تاریخ بمید وقتی او مرا در خانه و در زیر چادر زنده می ساخت و یاد زد و گفت حتا قبل از آن که بمیری از کسی اویت بمیری او عطف خیال مرا به زیبایی مرگ صلح مردن و آرامش نیستی گفت سپس قهرمانی از را رسید او وعده داد که اویت مرا عزت مرا نجات خواهد داد او کنون سالیانی می گذرند و می بینم که این قهرمان دروغ پردازی بیش نبود و که ابلیس مر را برادر Thank you for your attention. And this is, you know, a poem is coming from the heart. And I, it is touching every time when I read this poem. It makes me, you know, to cry. I'm coming from Afghanistan when the Russian invaded my country. And I was forced to leave, but unfortunately, I never get any chance to go back to see my homeland. But still, I, you know, my soul and my feeling in my country. This is the Thank book by the African woman. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Nahid, for sharing that with us and. She does those posters that she showed you of the uh, forbidding, you know, saying no to the burqa, which is just amazing what she has done there. And I love the, the theme that runs through your poetry, dying with no identity, which is what you are fighting against all the time. Thank you, Nahid. And now I would love to introduce to you someone most of you know, and this is Agneta Falk, who is a poet, an artist, and translator. Um, she's part of the World Poetry Movement and a founding member of the Revolutionary Poets Brigade. And I love to say she's also, in our international setting, a Swedish grandmother. So I would like to introduce to you the marvelous poet and artist, Agneta Falk. I don't have a picture. Oh, no okay. picture. Hmm. I don't have a picture. I don't know how to do it. I'll go on Jack's. I can't go on Jack's thing, okay? okay. Just a moment. There you are. Welcome, Agneta. <laughs> Welcome, Maggie. Okay, sure. I'm going to 
read a few poems, actually. About ten. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Joke. <laughs> My first poem is called Sold, and I dedicate that to women who have been sold into sexual slavery. If someone had told me, I wouldn't have believed it. Maybe I was dead. Maybe I am dead. My name is Slave. I don't remember much now. It stinks too much. If I go there, I can't enter unless I fill up the holes. But the hate, the loathing is still in me. That's why I barely look in the mirror. All I dreamt of was my grandma's white bedspread when I went down, down to the stench, the never ending stench, the unfamiliar hairy growings, the unmentionable, unthinkable filth of it all. And how she kept it so white in between feeding the cows and mucking out the stables, how she washed herself after a long day's work before slipping into bed. Every day, the smell of poverty and I so blinded by a promise from a stranger of a life somewhere else could not even begin to imagine that the whiteness of a bedspread on a bed in a dirt village would keep me from going, 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 hours, days, weeks, forever. Grandma with her soap bar, the sun filtering through that small window her veined hands keeping clean, soaping the floor. I thought I could do better. And here I am, sold, wishing for my body to fill up with sand, to plug all my openings, no entry written on my forehead, but they keep on coming. I don't even count anymore. They have dicks and money I never see and freedom's on the other side of the pane of the window, but I'm shit deep in shame. I can't move, but I know I can't be bought. They get a dead body to come alive on and in, and I always be just a body to them, but nobody to myself, but liberty soul alone. And then I am going to read a poem to a poet, a much beloved poet, Ruth Weiss, who died a bit over a year ago. And she was 91 and it's called Ruthful. Ruthful for Ruth Weiss. There are three words in the English language that describe you, Ruth perfectly, ruthful, truthful, and youthful. The rhythm of that pulse of life, your turquoise head bopping, filling any room you enter with the chenis de croix, and you know something is alive because the room's swinging and your deep voice's timbre rises from the floor, a steady beat beating through all those false notes, ever truthful. And that's sure a bendy road you traveled along with, I'm certain, a lot of ducking and weaving too. Last train out of Austria, maybe the last boat to America, but so many firsts in your words, such spring in your feet, ever youthful. And here you are, almost a century young, with all the grace of someone who's made light of darkness and shared it magically around without stopping and still do, not missing a beat, ever ruthful. Du bist immer schön und weise. Du bist Ruth Weiss. Yeah. Did I read that? Yeah. Slutty one? Yeah. And now finally, a very slutty one. Just a moment. 
It's on my phone because I couldn't find it. Excuse me. And it's called names. Names, it's called names. Just a moment. You need a little break here. There we go. There is a woman whose name escapes me because she's called so many names. Doll, slut, bitter fluff, whore, bitch, cow, honey, sugar, lass, missus, miss, crumpet, ball and chain, trouble and strife, concubine, broad, baggage, babe, bimbo, chick, skirt, dish, floozy, dame, and C, U, and T, which are spelled because the sound of it is as ugly as a basin full of dirty soap. She's also mother, daughter, doctor, historian, cleaner, writer, artist, nurse, rocket scientist, comedian, politician, teacher, architect, hairdresser, and more. He, whose name I don't always remember, on the other hand, is often referred to as son of a bitch and motherfucker. Thank you. Thank you, Agi. Thank you, Agneta. Yes, a, a real contrast in those poems. The first one about cleanliness that is not cleanliness. The, as you said, my name is slave and the smell of poverty. And then the poem about Ruth White, who's just wonderful. And then that fluff, as you said, of names that are not names that don't have any identity to them. It's just, just great. Thank you so much. And now, we will go to uh, maybe one of the farther poets coming in, and that would be Dottie or Dorothea Payne. Dorothy Payne is with us, international educator, artist, poet, who currently moves between San Francisco, St. Louis, Mexico City, and Guinea, West Africa, where she did work just recently for three years, and we missed her. Uh, she's performed her poetry internationally. Her poetry has appeared in several anthologies and her book, Birthmarks. She is setting up, as she showed you in right there, she's setting up her, um, it's in the picture, her studio. Um, she's a wonderful painter and she's setting up a painting studio in St. Louis, but she will be going back to Mexico, to Guinea, and then on to Congo. So maybe I've got some of that wrong, but it's hard to keep track of Scotty. So please, a wonderful poet and artist, we look forward to hearing you, Dorothy Payne. And you're muted. Everybody else mute. <laughs> now, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just made the final move into my new studio today. And so I was quickly going through my poetry to see what I wanted to read tonight. I realized almost everything I write is about women. Um, so, so that was, it was easy to find material. Uh, so then I thought about what do I, what do I want to say? What do I want to say to, to all of you, to the, the poets who have inspired me and supported me and, and been in my corner essentially for many years now. Um, and Nina, who is like the, the beacon for me as I get older and older of what a woman can continue to be for her entire life. So much, much respect to you, Nina, uh, for all of that. Um, so I chose work based on what I wanted to, to convey as a message in general to, to women on this International Women's Day. I taught in women's studies in 1970 something, I don't remember, I only mentioned that because it was the second one in the nation at the time at the University of Wisconsin and I'm forever dismayed by how much of our history has been lost. So that motivated some of my selections for tonight as well. So the first poem I'm going to read is a, a poem I've read multiple times. There's nothing 
uh, knew about it, but it still seems to be meaningful to me because so many people forget that we're not a minority. We are 57% of the human race. And it is an absolute outrage that we still have to fight for equality. And uh, so it seems to me that this poem sort of captures not only that, but our significance in the world. So it begins with a quote by Adrian Ritt. We need to imagine a world where every woman is the presiding genius of her own body, the width of a hip. The width of a hip measures everything, a woman, a door frame, a universe. Haunches stronger than Lucy's secure our premises and stake our claims. Measure things unseen, bone by bone, inches of invitation. Make space out of two dimensions, clarify chaos. The hip calculates all progressions, is the architect of all things demonstrates the need to see time realized, to feel the heat between our thighs, to do the dance required to converse across universes, to ensure intercourse with the gods. For hips lack randomness. They are precise, prescribed, sanctified structures for us to ride high on permutable matter for life to wallow in, infinite and wide. They create space, make everything out of nothing, cradle quantum songs to ensure we return to sting. So the next poem I chose, uh, it is the basis for the title of my my book, which which Jack Hersman paid a major, played a major role in helping me get published, and I will be forever grateful. But it also I chose it because many people don't realize that the women's movement, this generation of the women's movement, the second generation, and I don't mean that age-wise for us, I mean the second generation of the movement, started by working class women in New York City and radical women known as the Red Stockings. And their initial demands were for equal pay, for equal work, and nationally subsidized childcare. We have neither one of those today. So the movement not only has been an enormous failure in many ways, but it was co-opted by women who were not necessarily working class and did not necessarily have those goals at the forefront of the movement. So this is for the mothers. They were waitresses who filed the first lawsuits, who desperately wanted nationally subsidized childcare and desperately. Dottie, you muted yourself. I don't know why it does that. <laughs> okay. Ode to my birthmarks. They are birthmarks, not scars. Indelible constellations marking where I have been before here. Cosmic significations of earlier worlds, previous dreams, and well healed shoes. Old wives claimed they were mother's desires manifest on the source of our magnus opus, patterned fantasies. I like this account for it gives us some credit in it, but likely it is not. These birthmarks are not dreams made manifest. These are stamps marked paid. Sacred hieroglyphs where the past and the present met to indicate no further debt resides inside these thighs. Fishes, butterflies, little random stars even, well-placed codice, Mysteries meant to be held in highest esteem. There's a moon here and a little Venus even right along my main seam, along my highway to heaven. Little buoys set afloat 
marking the shores of a history that's deeply, deeply dipped. The next poem I uh, have read a couple of times. It's one of my newest uh, pieces. I've been very busy, so I haven't been writing as much as I, I usually did in the past. Uh, but when I thought of this poem, I thought of a line from Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon, a book I teach often. I think it's one of Toni's most brilliant, if you can even think of her works as some being more brilliant than others. But it's when she, the narrator is referencing a uh, pilot in the Song of Solomon, and this line resonates for me. She describes, the narrator describes Pilot as a woman who was true to the palm oil that flowed over her veins, for she never had a visitor for whom she did not offer food. And this poem I wrote in response to looking out my balcony window in Guinea at the market women who would get up uh, at the crack of dawn and cook and prepare food and load their wares on the top of their head and I described them from there. They literally feed the poor in Guinea. These women were the market women of Guinea. These women who are women even before they cease being children, who carry babies on their backs even before they cease being them, who carry loads on their heads like emerging little queens burdened with the earth's best bounty bread warm, fresh, and ready to feed the day before the sun has even risen. These women who walk like elegant antelopes, majestic necks stretched skyward, made long by all that seeking, lifting, seeing, rising. These beautiful women of Guinea, whose feet never seem to touch the ground, rather endorse, sweep, and preserve it. These women whose backs and breasts arch heavenward and assume fecund announcement. These manifestations of Oklo, origins of flesh and warm, warm loam. Praise her, this place of all beginning, shea lathered and beautifully irrefutable. Her flamboyance a flaunted affront to colonial cruelty. Her very existence, a declaration of war against poverty. Praise her glisteningness, her polyrhythmic refusal to acquiesce to a time linear and meaningless, not past, yet not fully present. Praise this blinding light of all existence. Her very breathing, her breeding and indignant insistence, her haughty hips a rebut to all attempts to eliminate her or her children. Praise these women who rise like the sun, flauntingly returning its radiance, indomitable flashes of the spirit. Gaze upon them. These women who carry our loads and all enduring things, praise them for they are all we are and now be, for they are us, our vivified rememory. And I will end with this one, an old one, but one I don't get to read very often. And it sort of, I think captures what I hope we're all headed towards. It's called Conquer This. Why does everybody treat me so evil and mean? I say, why does everybody treat me so evil and mean? Won't anybody tip their hat to a queen? Ma Rainey. Go ahead, try. Try to sing like Ma Rainey or Bessie Smith, to dance like Josephine did to write like Emily or Tony or Adrian Rich. I dare you. To take it all in stride like 14-year-old Sacagawea, young, already pregnant, most likely with Clark's infant. He called him my boy Pomp, even adopted him. 
Just try to be the 10 year old girl child won by a man to pay a gambling, gambling debt, then passed around like an empty plate. This young Shoshone salmon sister who changed an entire nation, the only one who knew what to do or where to go on that trek west. Go ahead, try. I dare you to be another Angelina Gremke who threw off the privilege of class and slaveocracy, defied woman-hating, race-crazed lynch mobs night after night, who hugged and loved the slave, insisted that memory, money, not biology, was the cause of all of it, that there was no such thing as race, who was the first woman in the United States to address a legislative body and proclaim slavery reduces a man to a thing. And I dare you to walk for miles throughout the Southwest, go from mine to mine alone, like Mother Jones. Be just like this Irish immigrant tenant farmer's daughter said, oh, until they wrote a song about you. She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. Be a miner's angel who wins strikes and fights for the most oppressed, who is declared to be the most dangerous woman in the U.S. by that racist D.A. Reese. Lose your husband and all four of your children to a yellow fever death and spend the rest of your life fighting like hell for the living. Create women's militias armed with brooms and mops. Call May Day your birthday. Crook your little finger and watch 20,000 men drop. Hum Aunt Molly Jackson's ragged, hungry blue while the Dreiser Committee is interrogating you. Be Woody Guthrie's union maid, fearless and unafraid. Go ahead, put on your walking shoes. And I dare you to stand up when nobody else would, like Fanny Lou in 1962. Sterilized in 61 against her will, she turned her rage around and said, I will, I will, when asked which Mississippi sharecropper would risk it all and go straight down to Ruleville City Hall and declare I am one woman and I want my one vote. Then I double dare you to get up off that cot after they've beaten you, nearly killed you, and stand tall, straighten your thin, torn dress, look them straight in the eye, throw your head back, and sing this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And with a switch of your hips, walk pure and sure straight out that jailhouse door while they just stare. Then I dare you to question America right to Hubert Humphrey's face, the vice presidential candidate of the United States. You mean to tell me your position is more important than 400,000 black lives? Mr. Humphrey, I'm gonna pray to Jesus for you. Oh yes, I dare you to be like Fannie Lou. And I dare you to be Dolores Huerta Strong and found your own UFW union. Organize a boycott that brings them to their knees. Get them arrested 22 times, then make them bow down to you. Stand tall even after they have beaten you on the steps of City Hall. Make those broken ribs into your tourniquet to stop the bleeding madness. I dare you to be the woman you always wanted to be. To forget your cars, your clothes, your 55 inch TVs. I call on you to become queens for the poor, to proclaim the power you were born with, to seduce truth, charm justice, outsmart those men in charge by taking command, taking action, and serving notice on them. Thank you. Thank you, Donnie. Boy, indomitable hips keep running through your poetry, the hips of the skinny women and then the hips of the indomitable women who are standing up for their own rights. Um, great poetry, thank you so much. And we come to Barbara Pashke, yes. Uh, translator, singer, she doesn't talk about that much. 
singer, poet, translator, bilingual, multilingual, more than bi, um, essential to our Revolutionary Poets Brigade anthologies, wonderful translations, poetry for credit. Uh, please welcome Barbara Pashkin. Ooh, kind of caught me there. Okay. Um, well, I have, I have a, uh, I'll, I'll try to be fast. Um, so a couple of poems by some uh, very feisty uh, Latin American, one Guatemalan and one uh, Chilean woman. And um, uh, this, this one is Ana Maria Rojas. And it is, I had two of her, so I'll just do one. Um, and I think for the sake of, I will read this one only English and then I'll read Hedy's in both languages, just to, in the um, respect of time. This is Ana Maria Rodas. Time is bringing out in me the qualities I daily seek, the richness of the sea beside my meager human life, love that encircles itself, Two or three persistent friends who don't back away despite my innumerable faults. It's made of plants, of absurd bricks, of light bulbs that turn on and turn off or burn out. My time consists a lot of turning my back on the rules of men. Uh, de un mucho da la espalda a las reglas de los hombres. Está hecho mi tiempo. So I thought that was. And this one, um, this one is called Proclama Uno by Hedy Navarro Harris. Me declaro ingobernable y establezco mi propio gobierno. Inicio un paro indefinido y que el país reviente de basura esperando mis escobas. Soy mujer de flor en pecho, y hasta que se desplomen los muros de esta cárcel, me declaro termita, abeja asesina y marabunta, y agaranse los pantalones. Las faldas ya están echadas. Proclamation number one. I declare myself ungovernable and establish my own government. I am beginning an indefinite strike and may the country burst with garbage awaiting my brooms. I'm a woman's woman until the wall and until the walls of this prison collapse, I declare myself termite killer bee and plague of ants and hold on to your pants the skirts have already been cast off <laughs> great barbara did you have another one or is that it well i do if there's time i mean it's yeah sure go ahead yeah, just well this is um Let's see, which one did I read? Okay. Oh, this is another of Ana Maria Rodas. Uh, la, gra la gramática miente como todo invento masculino. Femenino no es género, es un adjetivo que significa inferior, inconsciente, utilizable, accesible, fácil de manejar, desechable y sobre todo violable. Eso primero, antes de cualquier otra significación reconcilio. Grammar lies, like all masculine inventions. Feminine is not a gender. It's an adjective that means inferior, unconscious, usable, accessible, easy to handle, disposable, and above all, able to violate. That's first before any other preconceived meaning. So just wow. uh, give, the, 
Give me yeah. the braces in women and no offense to any of the men. <laughs> no, 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 no. We need to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're hearing it, Barbara. Go for it. Yeah. And yeah. now uh, Victoria, an outstanding member of our Revolutionary Poets Brigade. I am delighted to introduce Victoria Brio. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm really honored to be here among you. Uh, I'm going to read a poem. I just learned about this poet. Her name is Deborah. Something wrong? No, we're good. Uh, her name is Deborah A. Miranda, and she is a native daughter. Are we here? I can't see you. Okay, doesn't matter. See you and hear you, Victoria. Thank you, Lisbeth. I wasn't sure, suddenly it was all a blank space. Uh, Deborah Miranda, she's Ohlone Costanoan Esselin Nation Chumash. And she has a book called Altar of Broken Things that came out in 2020. This is called Torch. The old man cruises our neighborhood in a two-tone Chevy built like a fort. He offers 25 cents to the girls who will come close enough to let him pinch a cheek. Gaze hidden behind dark glasses, one hand on the wheel, one eye on the rear view mirror. Across the street, we dare each other. You do it. No, you do it. Pulled as much by the glory of what a whole quarter buys. By the yearning to be wanted by someone. We're just trailer court kids on a Saturday morning made of asphalt, shaggy pines and rain. Our mothers chain smoke Paul Malls inside thin walls. Fathers or stepfathers or mothers, boyfriends out hunting work or already drinking We've all spent nights waiting outside the Mecca in our parents' old cars, peering over back seats into dark windows as if wishing could erase those light years of distance. I am a hungry heart on skinny legs, standing on the edge of a journey, no maps, no guides, instincts muddled by neglect or abandonment or mistake, naked, letting other people dress me in trust, shame, lust. I want to say I will learn how to hide my longing that invisible sign scrawled on my forehead like an SOS revealing my location to the enemy. But the truth is something more like this. If there is a patron saint of trailer courts, if our lady of the single wide watches over pothole streets, crew cut bullies, stolen bikes and wildflower ditches. If children learn to brandish scabs and scars like medals. If a prayer exists to banish predators, well, no one taught me that magic. So I step into that road cross that street, take that bribe, and keep walking out of that trailer park 
away from that childhood. I follow my hunger, my emptiness, the flame on my forehead, not betrayal, but reminder. It's not wrong to want, to ask, not wrong. I keep the beacon lit so love might see me. That's Deborah A. Miranda. Thank you, Victoria. Um, an amazing picture of the trailer park, poverty, instability, and that, and that word, yeah, um, your heart, a hungry heart on skinny legs. A great life. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Christina, I, I just said you were, I, I chatted to you that you were next. So Christina Brown is a published poet and writer, lives in North Beach. She's modest about her accomplishments as lawyer and activist, but often writes about what people will and will not do for love. And I'm going to mute. Uh, good evening. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Karen and Manaz for making this possible. Um, I'd like to thank um, you all for being here. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to read with um, such a, with so many great women poets. I'm going to be reading two pieces, um, one shortish and the second one extremely short. So, together during the pandemic, written on February 21st, 2021. Together, we're all in this together, they say. And it's true, but you wouldn't always know it, not by the unequal way the burdens are distributed. But isn't that how it usually is? Women, probably the first group to be treated as less than others, absorb the shocks to society. So do black and brown people, anyone whose difference can be used as an excuse to discriminate against them. As the pandemic took off and schools closed, women working from home, stay at home moms too, sang the praises of their children's caregivers and teachers. I never appreciated how much they do the mother said, but soon enough, some of these safe at home women began to insist that schools reopen, that teachers, mainly other women, many with children too, return to the classroom without vaccination or any changes that would cost money. In some less savvy places, schools opened and closed, opened and closed. It was a revolving door, a repeat performance, except for the sick and dead teachers. The sick and dead were saddened family and friends around them. In California, the teachers, joined together in their union, worked together, held the line together. Most of their follow, fellow Californians supported them too. Now, here in California, teachers are on the list to be vaccinated. On Saturday, a bunch of teachers caravaned to a drive through vaccination site to receive their shots, each in a separate vehicle for safety. They were still together. And I have a happy addendum to this story that um, as of today, two weeks later, all uh, teachers in every 
every state. The strength of uh, California teachers, California men, has uh, once again um, made things better for everyone. Um, the second piece I'm going to read, um, well, it's something that we're all so familiar with. Phalluses, spring. Phalluses and penises and cocks. They're all so cute, so eager to be perky, to be of service. Too bad they can make even good men crazy. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, that was a good, a good call on uh, on togetherness and teachers unions and what we what we owe to the teachers and what we I mean there's a social responsibility that you make very obvious there. Thank you. And uh, Sarah Menifee, San Francisco poet, homeless movement organizer, and a founding member of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. First they came for the homeless and the Revolutionary Poets Brigade. Her latest poetry collection is called Cement from Swimming with Elephants publications. So Sarah, please welcome Sarah and mute. Hi. Hi, I'm very happy to be in this wonderful chorus of voices of beautiful uh, words. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a little choked up by it. Um, I'm going to read a poem. It was called 40 Years. I really could, should call it 50 or 55, but who's counting? It's for all, it's for all the low wage workers who keep this going. And so many of those are women. Most of those are women. If, if the low paid and no paid women stop working, we should. Uh, the th everything would stop. So this is, this is called 40 years. Working with the public 40 years this year, since the, those days working as a nurse's aide, Norma the Paiute and I talking about going out dancing when we got off at 11. <laughs> As we rolled an old man over on the bed, changing a dressing on a bed sore and the dirty linen, social and brutal. Got to know nakedness in all its ultimate forms, eating custard and baked potatoes left on trays in the utility room. The ceremonies of survival, how invisible they've been to me all these years there in that place where the poor old were abandoned, yet cared for in a way, had less to do with the endless bedpans and dirty linens than with tall John crying, I love you, I love you, while I lifted him onto the toilet, 98, and I was 17. How short life, and we must pay that rent, a room near the Truckee River, my uniform ironed on a towel on the floor. The trouble is when you start remembering work, you recollect the universe, also the oppression, how a man was dying in this county ward bed, crying out his last. The arrogant young doctor said, he's having DTs and left, he died. Only the low wage nurses aides and orderlies there beside him. Every caring hand seems to be on minimum wage. And what is a job? Intricate, oh, inextricable from every human dream. The social scene with all its sweetness and distortions. So I would trust a strong hand that had made a bed or two and a back that knew how to lift another up who'd seen the red of the blood of birth, the red foundation of the earth, and life's pulse over many others, those unacquainted with nakedness who can't conceive the look of a wound. That was not my young, that was not in my young mind then, 
but maybe now my pen can claim what then I surely didn't know when my ambition was to be an artist and to love. When Norma and I went dancing after work or drinking with her trailways bus driver friends. Thank you. What a story, great story, Sarah. And that goes back to when you were 17, um, lifting that man and you were just so young. Yeah, it's very heartbreaking, really, the pictures that you, that you paint, you do that so beautifully. Well, but solidarity, you know. Yeah, of course. Working, Thank worker you. solidarity, women solidarity, love for each other. Thank Just you. keeping the world turning, you know, that's what the workers do. And most of the low paid ones, preponderance of women. And so. you've, spent, you've spent your life seeing to it that certain people actually survive. I realize that. Yeah, I mean, we all do, right? So, thank okay, you. Elizabeth. I think you are, yeah. we're, we're getting near the end. <laughs> Lisbeth, thanks. Everybody should realize Lisbeth has been our incomparable host, hostess. And, um, and now we get to hear a poem from Lisbeth. Um, thank you, Karen. Um, thanks, everyone. This has been really quite wonderful. Um, I'm going to read just three short poems. Um, I selected them. They're I think they kind of have some symbiosis to them, but <clears throat> you can judge for that. This first one is um, Grand Old Diva for Ruth Weiss by A.D. Winans. She grooves with time, daytime, nighttime, bebop jazz time, dances with timeless time. All rhythm, no rhyme. Birds in flight flap their wings, populate with the wind. A magician's illusion where time and words move from celibate to shameless orgy. Feed off the flesh of the other, pause in roller coaster freeze stop action motion. She sings her song. Another night, another day, bitch slaps father time. Kaufman, son of jazz in her heart, Michelin in her blood. Jazz in the Fillmore, jazz on the Harlem rooftops, full moon rising with poems that dig into my mind, lost in a haze of motionless motion. Hmm. Um, this next one is by Diane De Prima. It's called Lilith of the Stars. For there is another Lilith not made for Earth, of whom it is said that when she is seen by men, it is as vapor, a plague, a cacophony of unique bells, straining and stranger. They pursue her unsubstantial course through this world and the next. She is, in fact, the archetypal foxfire of the stars, will of the wisp of empty space, cosmic marsh light that lures us away from heavenly spheres, our home, to wander forever between quasars at odds with the sound of the harmonious crystals, temple flower of the abyss, windless on which is wound that hope which exceeds proportion, ship that veers at an angle, white fox that leaps over tombstones. 
And my third poem is one I've written. And it's actually after a painting um, by Ellie Simons called Voyage of the Heart. My poem is called Voyage of the Heart Heroine. Navigating by the heat of sister sun and the cool of mother moon, the fate of this voyager lies in the froth of the tea colored sea and in the stars, like the double star Theta, flung far into the ether. Only the ardent fog tethers the heroine and her craft to the earth. In her vagaries, she tattoos her feet and eyes with hearts and calls out, ahoy, to the waves, third, fourth, and the other. Now grooving freely, now heaving her ego overboard like a toy. This is her yoga, but also her woe, threatening a grave among the coral reefs until she is beyond the weight, free at last. So may we remember the poets who have left us in recent times. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lisbeth. And as an archivist, um, and as one who has sponsored poetry on the maritime and the marine world, that was a beautiful last poem to give us, which celebrates, in a sense, the marine world, the ocean. Um, yeah, Lisbeth's a very busy lady, putting all that all that archive, finding archives and making sure they're all great. Um, they're all all there, so people can find the archives of our of our city and our state. Um, I wanted to make sure that I have not missed Antonietta Villamil because she was maybe going to come and I didn't see her. So if she's there, let me know. Otherwise, I will be doing a relatively short poem, but I thought um, it would be appropriate to do something on the indigenous women. And I wasn't, I had a few things if we were missing, but I think, well, Dottie mentioned the indigenous people, but we haven't, um, I think this is a nice way to end up. This is Sit Kala Sa. Um, and then we get Carol Denny to wind us up and go celebrate an evening of women. This is Sit Kalasa, was a Dakota Sioux. And anyway, I'll just read the poem. It, it pretty much tells who she was. Sit Kalasa, Sit Kalasa Dakota Sioux raised as a child, eight years freely running through streams and forests on her reservation until missionaries sent her east to learn the white folks' ways. Encouraged to be schooled, encouraged to assimilate, encouraged to subsume into white culture. She played the violin, composed and taught music, wrote an opera about her people, and knew she must return, must be a voice for the Sioux. She called herself a pagan, as did Clara Barton, believing in the power of earth and sky, the sacredness of the land and its waters and its people. She taught and spoke, her writing was acclaimed as a voice for her people. She lived and died between two worlds. She did not see the Standing Rock protests against pipelines running through her land. She did not see the fatal hand of COVID decimate her people. Even her grave at Arlington National Cemetery bears only her married name, not the name of Sitkalasa. Dakota Sioux, activist for her people. So with that, I bring a, almost a close. I want to thank everybody who has been here, who has given this illuminating poetry. I think it's been an incredibly, incredibly deep, profound evening of poetry from all of you. 
and I feel very much enriched by all of it. So thank you for coming. For those of you who just listened, thank you for coming and listening. And um, thank you, John and Lisbeth. Yes. <laughs> Yay, for hosting us. Thank you, Manaz. Thank you, Luz. Thank you for the guests who came who might never have come unless we invited you. And Manaz invited the wonderful Luz to come. And we've heard so, so many beautiful voices. I just can't iterate all of them. But I would like to bring Carol Denny back to give us a song in closing to you know, light our evening home out of Zoom. Carol. <laughs> I'm honored to um, honored to uh, be the last part of the bookend. I just want to say I'm so thrilled to hear so many languages too. It, it yeah, I cried all the way through this, so I'm, I'll see what's left of me. But I have something I really wanted to play for you that's called "Convince All the Poets They're Crazy." all poets they're crazy convince them they never will fly it's a bird it's a plane it's delusion sit down and shut up and then die be impressed with the man with the money clap your hands when he waves it around dance without moving a muscle Sing without making a sound. Tell all the artists they're crazy. Tell them they're sick and on fire. Tell the poets that nobody's listening. They're a fake and a fraud and a liar. Convince everybody they're worthless. They'll never catch on or get by. Convince all the children they're ugly. Tell them it's hopeless to try. Tell all the dreamers it's useless. They just didn't get here in time. And make sure they all think it's too wide a river and too high a mountain to climb. Make sure they all think it's too wide a river and too high a mountain to climb. Well, tell all the artists it's over. It's embarrassing they didn't know. It's a pointless dead end of a journey. And the funeral was years ago. There were bouquets of flowers and speeches. It was really a beautiful day. It would help if they pick up the pieces and maybe get out of the way. Tell all the dreamers it's useless. They just didn't get here in time. And make sure they all think it's too wide a river, too high a mountain to climb. Make sure they all think it's too wide a river, too high a mountain to climb. Make sure they all think it's too wide a river, too high a mountain to climb. Make sure they all think it's too high a river, too high a mountain to climb. That's my gift to you. You're the bravest people on earth with the most extraordinary vulnerability. You're my kind of warriors. Thank you. I love that. Wonderful song. I've heard it before and I love it every time. And uh, that was, did you say exquisite vulnerability? I'm not sure yes. what you said, but yeah. yep, I think that's true. That's where all of this comes from, this the beautiful Mandarin, the beautiful, uh, the languages, the, the sensitivity, the, I mean, I'm weeping too. It's just yeah. to this power. journey with women. 
Yeah. Uh, it's been so focused on women in a way that I've never heard before. And yeah. I just am terribly moved by that voice, the voice of women, all different women, different women's voices, different women's languages, and the and actually the support and the the outreach that you have made to other women. And it's just it's just been very beautiful. So I thank all of you for enduring. What is it now? It's 927, so two and a half hours. <laughs> um, Marvelous. Beauty, yes, two and a half hours of beauty. Thank you so much. Have a, you know, take care of yourselves, fellow women, comrade women. Um, don't make me cry anymore. Just <laughs> care. I feel so blessed that I'm one of you. <laughs> Thank you all for everything. Thank you, Carol, for being our bookends. And uh, of all of you, your wonderful guests who came in, Devorah and Jamie and, and Clara Sue. And um, I just feel so honored that, um, yeah. that you were able to spend the time coming. And Nina and Luz and yes. I don't know if I missed anybody, but I just feel Barbara, everybody, Manaz. I just, just feel so lucky. Christina, Nahid, um, Aggie, so glad that you joined us. And, and Lizbeth, thank you again. And, no, oh, I haven't, don't think I've said everybody. Dottie, so great that you've made it all the way from Missouri. <laughs> so anybody, um, thank you, thank you, and take care of yourselves. Thank you, John, thank you, Lisbeth, for hosting. Yeah. And yeah. Carl, I see you're there, hi. And Greg, thank you for coming and listening to us. And Jean, thanks so much for your beautiful poetry. Oh, so, and Yolanda, I see you're here too, wow. Great people. Thank you so much. And um, until next year. All right.